I was really fascinated as a product of Jungle Fever with the idea of this intercultural relationship stuff. And, um, because, and my parents, because my father was a scholarship student from Samoa and had come to Invercargill in Dunedin, and all his contemporaries, all his brown friends had married white women. And so I was really fascinated with the whole idea of jungle fever. And, um, and that's where that story came from, um, which was, yeah, kind of a bit touchy at the time, funnily enough, yeah. Um, even though it was the 90s, it was, there was, yeah, was a lot of, people got offended, some people. Um, but that's where that came from, yeah. That was cool, that was, um, I wrote that story about my friend Cindy of Samoa, who we all know and love, um, who's like, um, she's the mascot of the Mona Samoa and this really famous figurehead in, in, in Samoa and she's iconic as a, as a, in, a, in the community here and there. And um, her story just always really fascinated me. I mean, just because she's just someone who's just negotiated all these worlds with absolute confidence, you know. Um, and I don't want to make it really a fa fa story, but it, but it was just her journey, really, um, from being a queen in Samoa to being a queen here. Yeah, that was really fun. That was cool. Tangata Pacifica was, was the shining beacon of Pacific media in, in the 80s and 90s, because it wasn't anything else. And so, you know, if you were vaguely interested in doing some sort of journalism um, and you were interested in moving image stuff, then Tangata was it. So I remember applying and applying and applying, <laughs> and I went and did work experience at one stage. Um, and then, but you know, the jobs were so few and far between because there was like budget for five journalists, I think, and or five reporters, and that was it. So um, when finally someone left, um, I managed to get an interview and to, and to get in. It was so amazing back then because um, because it was off peak tally and it was speaking to a specific community. In a lot of ways, we had tons of freedom to do stuff because. Um, you know, it was so far off the radar for the network to monitor a lot of times. And so there wasn't the same pressure for um, mainstream filtering stuff, you know, and um, we didn't have a lot of, I mean, we, we could really, we, we were in a unique position of being able to speak directly to an audience. Um, and that was awesome, you know, because you didn't have to sort of do a story about child poverty, but um, do it so that you know, the 1% of the mainstream audience that may be watching could understand it, blah, blah, blah. And we did a lot of language stuff. And, um, and Stephen Staline, who shoulder tapped me and brought me on, um, was amazing to work with in that he gave us so many opportunities to do things. I think we were lucky because, I, you know, I mean, now the days of event-based tally are uh, pretty much done, really, in that sense. So I think we were really lucky that we managed to create this series that was just on this festival, um, which is, you know, the biggest one of its kind in the world. And we started, in, I think we did it as a separate production in 2005, and we've done it every year since. So it had a really good long run. Yeah, and that was... That was just awesome to work on, and had um, for the, even now, like we we do Polyfest as part of Fresh, our program Fresh, and so I get five different directors who do the five stages, and they just go into massive competition mode. It's hilarious. They they you know pull all the tricks. Like I see one bribing the Halicam guy to do piece to cams, and one's running around with green screen suits and everything, and they just pull out all stops to make their ep the best ep. Um, and you know, really amazing team that um, have worked on that for a long time, who are really, really into it, like really into their stage performances and just into working with those kids. The Otara markets then in the 90s were much, much bigger as well, and they had they had a lot more Pacific stuff from the islands. There was a lot more kind of um, Pacific original island handicraft stuff the parallel importing thing had just happened, so there wasn't as much $2 shop stuff as there probably is now. So I think, I think we captured it at really the right time. And they had great performances every Saturday. It was awesome. They had, um, you know, 
Cook Island groups and really amazing singers and you know so it was kind of like this whole melting pot of colour and and I just wanted to capture some of the stories of some of the people there you know because it was like a nice little microchasm of um, of different little community stories you know it was great that they put that on prime time and that they chose it for a DNZ yeah oh how times have changed um, so, you know, like, again, I think I was really lucky doing things at the time I did them um, because the landscapes changed so much. Um, so they took a punt on Oscar and I really wanted him to present it because I knew that he would be awesome. And I remember pitching him to the network and um, sitting in a room with the commissioners there and they were all going, oh, untapped talent. And I was telling Oscar, he's going, I've been tapping for years. I've been tapping every week. I was really fascinated and still am with the malu, the female malu. Um, and so I just made this little piece um, called Mea Sina Samoa, Tales of the Malu, um, which was, it was just sort of a, some, it was, there's this old legend in, in this song that um, tells this awesome story of how the woman bought the tattoos to Samoa because it was the woman who were tattooed, not the men. And they go diving for this clam and they kind of get the bends and they come up and they get the story reversed when they're swimming back from Fiji. It's a cool story. Um, yeah, so that's what that was. It was just like a little kind of illustration of that story and some woman talking about what their malu means to them. When we started out, we were an hour long. We had 16 hours and we had so much in an hour. We just basically worked around the clock because we were so determined it was just going to be awesome. And um, I'm so lucky that, <clears throat> I'm so grateful too that, you know, everyone I brought on board, because it was our first shot at doing it, it was like the first time in, in 30 years there'd been another chance to make some Pacific Tally. Um, we just went nuts. And everyone who worked on it and who created the show with me was just so dedicated to it. And, you know, I mean, the hours they spent doing every single little segment. There's so much work that went into it. That was just... Oh, 2010 was a very hard year, but um, you know, I was so proud of it. When we, that we've season one of Fresh, which when it was an hour long, is almost like a cult um, package hit. Now people still want the box set of Fresh season one, um, and but the really cool thing is that the community went nuts for it, um, and I think they went nuts for it particularly because it was the first time we'd um, sort of done. We'd spoken in our own lingua fraca to, you know, we'd, we'd used fresh speak and we um, have sort of this little ebonic segment like um, electric company where you say these words and then you do your fresh interpretation. And so I think it was one of the first times that a lot of Pacific kids had ever seen themselves on the tally, nuts and bolts, warts and all, as they really were, you know, in their own language. And the language was really important, yeah. Coconut, um, we just love working on because we're making this content again that's speaking directly to our audience and we've got control over it. It's the best thing. There's no commissioners. There's no, we just know what people want to see and then we just make it and then we just see it going because there's, the, the thing is there's just nothing else. I mean, the reason the coconut's been really successful and it's got really high numbers is because specific people are just so um, underserviced in broadcasting and everywhere else. And so, and, and if we are on tally, we're on at terrible times. So um, to have at the touch of your fingertips content that you can just bring up that actually talks to you, no mainstream filters, you know, um, and it's kind of rare, unique content in that there's nothing else like it online. Um, one of the focuses of the coconut has been to, is how to do things the Pacific way in the modern day. And um, the reason that we pitched it like that and we wanted to do the portal like that is because there's such a big Kiwi Pacific audience of um, Kiwis, Kiwi Pacificans who are really wanting to know more about their heritage and their island homelands. So a lot of it is island material, how to wear a ta'uvala, how to get into a nightclub in Fiji, how to dodge a flying jandal, how to... Um, how to do traditional fishing, how to... Um, 
wear a lava lava make a a I mean all those sorts of things but specifically to Kiwi Pacific people and it's just awesome to work on because you know you're working with island communities and bringing their stuff here as well and and you know the one of the most fulfilling things and the most enjoyable things I've ever done in my life and most of my colleagues is working in island communities around the region you know so the communities in New Zealand and then the different communities in the islands and and having the luxury to bring those stories to screen is the best thing. <laughs>